Thanks for uh, the invitation to uh, Lumini. It's a pleasure to be here and the organizers. So, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is uh, 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 based on uh, earlier joint work with Hendrik Weber, through whom I really got into uh, this area of stochastic partial differential equations. Uh, and then uh, a more recent uh, work with him and uh, two postdocs at the Max Planck Institute, uh, Jonas Sauer and uh, Scott Smith. So the, the setting, so the, the, um, the question or kind of the goal we want, to, uh, we want to understand or we want to address is uh, a quasi-linear uh, stochastic partial differential equations, singular quasi-linear stochastic partial differential equations in the spirit of rough path theory so in the spirit of kind of dividing up uh, uh, an offline uh, a stochastic treatment and uh, a completely deterministic treatment or construction of a de completely deterministic solution operator. So that's the general spirit. And the type of equations we're interested in would have this form. So they would be typically parabolic, although there is, as you will see, there is not a big difference between elliptic and parabolic in this talk but uh, let's stick to parabolic because that's uh, kind of more in the tradition of the field, uh, with the leading order symbol uh, that's uh, nonlinear or quasi-linear in a mild way, quasi-linear in the sense that the coefficients in front of the leading order term, let's say the spatial term, depend on the solution itself. And, uh, uh, and here I'm, I'm thinking, or we're thinking of uh, uh, this type of non-conservative formulation. So, uh, there is first the coefficient, and then there are the two spatial derivatives, which uh, in a sentence makes the nonlinearity worse than if uh, one had the similar situation in the uh, in, a, in kind of a conservative formulation of the parabolic equation. And uh, so, uh, in this talk, uh, uh, I will use notation from one spatial dimension because that's easier to write down. But uh, at least for the deterministic part, you will see that this is just mere convenience. So uh, everything uh, 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 can be extended to uh, multiple space dimensions like here, and U could be a system. So there are no kind of easy transformations which would allow you to uh, transform away this nonlinearity. And But then we make a kind of a more substantial simplification for our purposes, namely that we uh, introduce very convenient boundary conditions, not just uh, uh, periodic boundary conditions in space, which of course are the most convenient spatial boundary conditions, but also periodic boundary conditions in time, uh, which, uh, uh, which are convenient too, because that allows us to use kind of convolutions in both variables. So in that, in that respect, we're really treating uh, uh, this parabolic operator very much like an elliptic operator. And uh, so uh, that's uh, a convenience for us, but on the other hand, uh, it has the advantage that uh, we're not lured into making assumptions, non-generic assumptions on the initial data, which would allow for an exist short time existence theory, which perhaps is not the right thing. So, uh, so there's also an advantage, at least to start with this type of setting. So, uh, and then in order to drive the point home, we, we kind of even change notation. Uh, we uh, uh, we uh, uh, name, rename the spatial variable X as X1 variable and the time variable as x2 variable. So really, uh, we're really kind of thinking of uh, this as being a, a determinist, I mean, a, a kind of more of an elliptic operator. So let me write it down. So uh, there is the uh, time-like variable, and then there is the uh, space-like variable, and there is the driver. Let me write it like this. And since we're uh, dealing with something that's periodic in space-time, uh, we better put the projection onto uh, the cons onto uh, onto the mean I mean the spatial mean zero functions here. So this p is uh, uh, just defined p of f is f minus the uh, mean value of f. But in most of the talk, I will not write down the the p in order to simplify uh, simplify notation. 
So that's the, uh, that's the setting. Again, uh, um, so, uh, oops, again, uh, uh, one space dimension just for simplicity and space time periodic for, uh, for convenience. So, uh, so what's, the, uh, uh, what's the issue? We want to consider uh, in the spirit of uh, kind of a deterministic treatment of a stochastic PDE, we want to consider this type of PDE with a very rough driver, F. So what means rough? Uh, we're used to, in this community, we're used to measure that in terms of uh, uh, the Hölder scale. So I'm using Hölder spaces, not Bezov spaces here. Uh, and since we're dealing with a parabolic problem, we have to use the right uh, metric on time space, the parabolic metric, and then the Hölder spaces and Hölder norms are defined as, as usual by looking at the modulus of continuity with respect to the alpha power of, uh, of this distance and Hölder spaces, uh, positive Hölder spaces are just those spaces where this uh, norm is finite and negative Hölder spaces are defined as uh, taking derivatives of positive Hölder functions. So that's, uh, that's all very uh, kind of conventional and usual. So, uh, so what's, the, uh, uh, what's the issue here? Uh, let's think of the right-hand side of uh, a regularity which I want to describe as being in a typically negative Hölder space uh, with the exponent alpha minus two. So in the best of all worlds, uh, the parabolic uh, operator increases the regularity by two. So you itself, uh, and we cannot expect better, should be in C alpha, which means that the second derivatives of U should be again in C alpha minus two. So the second derivatives, second spatial derivatives of U are in the same, in the best case, in the, uh, in the same regularity class as F. Whereas nonlinear transformations, if provided the nonlinearity sigma and A are smooth, are uh, again in the original, uh, in, in the original Hölder space C alpha. And now, uh, uh, you see that this nonlinearity here has exactly the same issue or the same problem as this nonlinearity. Uh, this nonlinearity, so this type of multiplicative noise nonlinearity, only makes a classical sense if uh, the uh, function is more regular uh, than the distribution. So on the Helder scale, if alpha, which is the level of regularity of this function, and alpha minus two, which is the level of regularity of the distribution is positive, which is equivalent to alpha larger than one. And now you see that you get exactly the same, you do exactly the same uh, power counting uh, computation on this term uh, on the same condition. So in a certain sense, both of these terms have the same flavor in terms of, uh, in terms of their singular structure. And therefore, uh, uh, therefore, it's not surprising that uh, kind of techniques which have been developed for this, uh, uh, for this product can also be used uh, for this product. In fact, it's a little bit more subtle because this product in some sense is more nonlinear be because both factors depend on the solution. But in terms of power counting, it's the, uh, it's the, same, uh, it's the same issue. So, uh, so that means the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the goal will be to make sense of this, uh, uh, to construct a solution operator for this equation in the singular range, in the range when alpha is strictly less than one, which means that the right-hand side is uh, a distribution of an order which is more negative than minus one. And, uh, uh, and uh, the interesting uh, kind of uh, case would be to, uh, at least in one space dimension, to include the exponent alpha is equal to one half, because alpha is equal to one half uh, corresponds to uh, a right-hand side uh, F that's of white noise, because as we've seen already in many talks, white noise in, in uh, one parabolic, in, in, in sp a parabolic space time with one space dimension is of the order dimension minus dimension over two, effective dimension three, so minus three halves. Three halves is one half minus two. So uh, the white noise case is slightly worse than alpha is equal to, uh, uh, to uh, 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 one half. That means uh, in this uh, hierarchy, uh, in this hierarchy which we're used uh, to from rough path, uh, we should shoot for the interval of alphas between one half and two over five. 
So, uh, uh, and that's exactly uh, the, uh, the range of uh, alphas that was treated in the uh, semilinear case. So in case of a constant coefficient in a paper by Martin Haya and Etienne Pardou, where, uh, uh, where they developed a, a solution theory exactly in this range. So now kind of our goal is to, uh, 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 to push, uh, to extend this type of uh, 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 um, uh, regularity theory or construction of the solution operator from semi-linear to uh, uh, quasi-linear. That's, uh, that's, uh, that's the question or the quest. So, uh, um, so that's something, uh, as I said, Henrik and I uh, uh, started uh, already a bit more than two years ago where uh, we uh, uh, dealt with kind of the least ambitious singular range. I mean, so let me write down this interval. So uh, alpha between uh, uh, one and one half is already singular, but that's the least ambitious. Then it goes down, sorry, two thirds. Then it goes down to one half, and then it goes down to uh, two fifth. And so uh, that's where uh, that's where we started, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, kind of extended uh, uh, rough path ideas uh, to this uh, to this framework. And then uh, this uh, triggered quite uh, quite some activity. So I, I, if I put it positively, it, I say it triggered. If I put it more critically, it said it provoked because people. <laughs> um, uh, so there were uh, there were more work. So uh, uh, so we used in a certain sense very uh, uh, I mean the, essentially the uh, controlled rough path notion of uh, Gubinelli. Then uh, uh, this was uh, kind of redone quite differently using the same parametric ansatz, which I will explain in a second. Using the para calculus, so para controlled uh, 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 path. And uh, then, uh, kind of with the same calculus, there was uh, uh, there was the uh, the work by this group, and then uh, more recently, uh, Mate Gerenser and uh, Martin Heira uh, used uh, the uh, um, regularity structures to uh, uh, kind of part of uh, my understanding is that part of their work is general, but uh, kind of the explicit computation of the renormalization term is done in this interval, and. Uh, and we uh, uh, recently used kind of went back to uh, this method and combined it with ideas from regularity structures, and went into the uh, the same interval, which is which is this one. And today I want to uh, uh, convince you that these ideas can also be used uh, in this interval, which is the interesting interval for white knowledge. So, uh, and in order to make things simple. Uh, I will uh, kind of drop this uh, nonlinearity, which anyway I already dropped here in front of the uh, in front of the uh, uh, in front of the f term because that's the uh, oops that's the more traditional uh, that's the more traditional thing. Okay, so that's uh, that's the uh, that's the plan for uh, for uh, for this talk, and uh, I think what what sets our uh, approach to these quasi-linear equations apart from uh, the uh, three other teams is that um, we take a kind of a more PDE inspired approach in the sense that if you want to solve a quasi-linear equation by small data analysis, you first build a good theory for a variable coefficient linear equation. That's the general approach uh, to uh, the general PDE approach to uh, kind of deterministic nonlinear problems. You build up a good linear theory a fairly general linear theory, and then in a certain sense, the quasi-linear theory falls into your lap uh, just by kind of fixed point argument. So that's our approach, and I think in that sense, we're doing something different, slightly different at least than the other teams. So, uh, so that means uh, instead of looking right away at the quasi-linear problem, we'll be focusing on kind of developing, uh, developing a solution theory for uh, this linear problem with a given non-constant coefficient. So uh, now again, uh, let me write it, this down. So f is rough, alpha minus two. The coefficient field is uh, uh, is not very regular, just Helder continues uh, with the small Helder constant, which is in the interval between two fifths and one half. And uh, 
And uh, so, so in a certain sense, we use this strategy of divide and conquer twice in the sense that we first develop something which uh, one might call a semi-concrete solution theory. So uh, we give a sense to the solution operator just using kind of a minimal model in the language of regularity structures. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, using our twist on uh, uh, the, the kind of the two main ingredients for uh, regularity structures, which are integration, an integration result, and a reconstruction result. And then, uh, depending on what concrete problem we have in mind, we post-process that uh, uh, kind of general theory where you can easily see that you can go all the way down to alpha equal to zero uh, to something more specific, which is targeted towards the specific nonlinearity which you have in mind. And here, the simplest case is if the coefficient just depends linearly on the solution, in which case you have to take a model which consists of seven um, uh, seven elements, but I'll, I'll, uh, I'll explain that in a second. So again, uh, so not only are we not right head-on attacking the nonlinear problem, but first uh, developing kind of a linear theory. Also, this linear theory we're dividing into a semi-concrete and a concrete step by first uh, by first uh, uh, looking at, at this problem, which I'm going to explain in a second, where the structure the, where the structure of the problem is most. Uh, 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 most, uh, most clearly uh, most becomes most apparent. So that's the, uh, uh, that's the strategy for, uh, for what I want to, uh, to present. So uh, let's start just with this problem, and let's ask the question, what do we need in order to give a sense to this uh, differential operator? And here I'm using kind of this uh, diamond symbol to make sense that you shouldn't think of this as being a standard product. I mean, you can, but uh, uh, in typically in the relevant situation, it has to be a renormalized product. And, uh, uh, and so I, I, I'll explain kind of the minimal model uh, we need in this case and the assumptions on the model. And uh, I state the main result uh, with its two ingredients, an integration and a reconstruction part. And I'll show you that this, these two ingredients can be buckled in, uh, in, 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 the in the usual perturbative regime. So here is, uh, here is the minimal model. Uh, let me also write this down on the blackboard. Uh, we, need, uh, we need here, we just need three functions, and if we were to go further down with alpha for every interval below, we would add one function more. And, uh, and that's this parametric ansatz we introduced in the first paper. So we need a placeholder which we typically call A0 for uh, the coefficient field. And that's in an ellipticity range which stays bounded away from zero and, uh, and infinity. And then uh, we're looking at the linear heat equation, but the linear heat equation now depends on this parameter, on this placeholder A0. So uh, we don't just get a single function, but we get a one parameter family of functions. So uh, we're looking at uh, uh, the function v alpha, which is a function of x, and depends on this parameter, and is defined uh, by the constant coefficient uh, heat equation with the right-hand side f. So that's the object we already had in the first paper and which uh, Gubinelli and co-workers also uh, uh, used in their paper. And now we go just uh, kind of as many steps further as, as we need. Uh, we make the assumption that we can give a sense to uh, the, um, that there is something like distribution, which formally is the product of A and uh, the second spatial derivative of this function, and then we solve again. And then we do that once more, and that's enough for uh, this purpose but it's clear that uh, how it would go on. Okay, so, uh, so that's, uh, that's the model we're working with. So uh, we, uh, we have three functions and kind of these two uh, distributions we have, to, uh, we have to postulate. Now what are the assumptions on these, on these objects? So uh, that's a somewhat busy slide, but uh, 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 let me start with uh, uh, the level alpha, which is uh, here. So that's level alpha 
2 alpha, 3 alpha. So uh, on the level alpha, we make kind of the usual assumption that the, uh, uh, that the right hand side, the distribution, should be of order alpha minus 2. So that's our negative Hölder norm. And uh, we kind of give ourselves a size measure and the constant we call n, like uh, Krulov likes to call constants in Schauder theory. And, uh, and here is again what uh, uh, the definition of uh, V alpha. And then by standard Schauder theory, we know that V alpha is uh, a Helder continuous of order alpha. That's what this alpha stands for. And it has n as many derivatives in A0 as you want. Because taking derivatives of this, uh, of this equation shows you that kind of regularity does not degenerate. And the second index denotes uh, the number of derivatives we can afford. So that's uh, level alpha, which was in the first paper. And now we have to go uh, to level two alpha and level three alpha by the same procedure. We have a function A, which has range in the ellipticity range. We have a distribution, which depends on the parameter A0. Um, we know uh, that uh, the function is, I mean, we may just assume that the function is C alpha. And of the distribution, um, we make uh, uh, the, uh, the, the type of assumption uh, we already, uh, which is just kind of a convenient rephrasing of the typical rough path assumptions, and which we express in terms of uh, uh, what we call, what can be considered as a commutator. So uh, we want to uh, make a connection between this distribution and the two ingredients, namely the function A and the derivative of VA. And the connection we want to make is the following. So this is a distribution, so we better convolve it to get a function. This is a distribution, so we also convolve it to get a function. We look at the difference. If, uh, uh, if everything is okay, this difference should be small, and the type of condition we assume is that in the L infinity norm, this should be less than a length scale t to the power two alpha minus two. This t here denotes convolution of scale, spatial scale t one quarter. I explain in a second why this is a kind of a strange spatial, why, why we use this strange spatial scale. This is a quadratic object, so the constant should be called n square, and uh, this should hold for all uh, convolution scales less less than t uh, less t than t than one, and uh, that's uh, exactly uh, how this norm here is defined, and uh, and we don't uh, we could for the definition of this norm we could use any convolution operator here, but for the proof of the reconstruction theorem. It's very convenient to use not just any convolution, but to use a convolution that has a semi-group property. That tremendously, sim or somewhat simplifies the reconstruction theorem. So semi-group properties in connection with the para-controlled calculus has already been used. I think here we do it somewhat differently. So uh, uh, we use the semi-group, which is generated by kind of the, uh, the square of the parabolic operator because that's an elliptic operator in time space and has the right scale. But uh, the, what matters to us is just the right scaling and the semi-group property. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the offline assumption on level two alpha. Then we define V two alpha as stated. Then by our integration theory, we get uh, a controlled rough path condition for uh, uh, for V2 alpha, and let me write it down in uh, full glory so that uh, this uh, um, um, notation becomes more obvious. So this expression should be less than, that's a square quantity times the parabolic distance to the power uh, two alpha between the points x and y. And that's exactly uh, one of these uh, uh, a controlled rough path conditions a la Gubinelli. And the twist is that uh, 
now uh, we're comparing increments of the function we're interested in to increments of another function, but this other function depends on this parameter a of x, and here I should also put the a of x. Uh, sorry, no, um, that's uh, a zero here. Um, but here uh, we have a, uh, we have kind of a derivative appearing uh, uh, with respect to uh, with respect to the parameter. So that's uh, uh, and we for this here we write. Uh, Instead of writing this out, uh, we write uh, these uh, square brackets to denote this type of differences. So that's again a shorthand notation uh, for this uh, for this condition. So that's the uh, that's something which comes out. So uh, uh, from uh, from this bound by our integration result, we get this uh, a controlled rough path condition. And now we just have to go one, uh, one step further. We now make a kind of a, a type of commutator condition to level three alpha minus two on this product. And from integration, we get a modeledness condition to order three alpha on the new function V three alpha. And uh, so since three alpha is larger than one, we also need to subtract linear terms in the definition of this norm. And then we even need to make assumptions uh, on uh, level four alpha on the product between A and this uh, third order function. So, uh, so those are the offline conditions and there is a nice hierarchy of norms or kind of type of uh, size measures. There are kind of negative size measures which involve these commutators and there are positive size measures which involve these rough, uh, these rough uh, controlled rough path conditions. And, uh, and the second index always denotes how many derivatives in the parameter I want to control. So here's again, uh, here's again in, on one slide, uh, the, uh, the assumptions, the usual assumption on the right hand side, which gives us uh, uh, control on V alpha, uh, the commutator assumption on uh, the product of A and the first spa second spatial derivative of V alpha, which gives us a, a kind of a controlled rough path condition on V two alpha, Another commutator condition, which gives kind of a higher order controlled rough path condition on V3 alpha, and the last commutator condition. So that's the, uh, that's the hierarchy of, uh, of problems. And here is, uh, here, is the, here is the main theorem of this, uh, of this uh, result. So we seek uh, solutions which are of this form. We make, in a certain sense, a very specific ansatz of how the solution look, should look like in terms of the model. So uh, it involves uh, uh, the, the sum, or perhaps I write this also on the blackboard, so that's the, uh, um, that's in a certain sense the ansatz. We say that at, at least in terms of increments, you should look like uh, V alpha plus V two alpha plus V three alpha, and then something which very much looks like Taylor, a times the parameter derivative of V alpha plus V two alpha uh, plus A square over two times the second parameter derivative of V alpha. And uh, this still depends on the parameter A zero, so we need to evaluate it at A zero. So this means evaluation at A zero is equal to A of X. And, uh, and so what, uh, uh, what this really means is that uh, provided the size measure is sufficiently small, there exists a unique pair of a function and a unique pair of such a product so that the uh, PDE is satisfied. But of course, uh, uh, we need to impose restrictions. So first of all, we need to say what we mean by this product. And that's uh, uh, kind of specified by this uh, fifth order commutator condition, which exactly tells you how this commutator looks like and determines uniquely this product. And we need to say that the, we want to look at the function in this class, which means we have this, uh, uh, this controlled rough path condition on, uh, on U itself. 
And in this, uh, in this class, we built, the, uh, we built the solution theory. And I guess it's clear that uh, this uh, extends if, uh, to any, uh, any, uh, any alpha with kind of the same, without kind of increasing too much the complexity here. How much time do I still have? Uh, 15 minutes. Okay. So uh, here again, I spelled, uh, kind of I spelled out what these conditions really mean. Uh, this rough path condition, we'll see that perhaps in a second, really means that uh, 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 we can well approximate the function by jet, uh, which, is, uh, which depends on, on the base point x and which is given by this expression. We can approximate the, uh, our function by this jet to order 4 alpha. And there is a very similar statement uh, uh, when it comes to this, uh, uh, when it comes to this um, uh, um, a commutator term where we have a, a base point uh, dependent family of, uh, uh, um, of distributions which are, controlled in, uh, which are controlled in the sense. So that's kind of boiling down the, uh, the, the statement of the main theorem. So, uh, so what are the two ingredients uh, uh, for this theorem? So like, like always kind of in, in, in uh, in, um, in, uh, in regularity structures, the two ingredients are on the one hand an integration result and on the other hand a reconstruction result. Here is the integration result. Uh, putting the integration results, uh, the integration result uh, into words states the following. If, uh, um, if, your, if your solution satisfies a controlled rough path condition to R the three alpha and you have a commutator relation to R the four alpha, then you increase the controlled rough path condition from three alpha to four alpha. So here's the statement. Uh, uh, green is the controlled rough path condition to order three alpha with some constant n prime. Uh, that's the uh, commutator condition to order four alpha minus two with a constant which I want to name like this. And then we get kind of the improved, the upgraded rough path condition to order four alpha. That's the integration step. And the reconstruction step is uh, if you have a controlled rough path condition of order four alpha, then you get a commutator condition of order five alpha minus two because we're in the range where five alpha minus two is larger than zero. And here is the statement. That's the, uh, uh, that's the uh, kind of rough path condition of order four alpha. And that's the commutator condition which gives the existence of a distribution to order five alpha. And now you can buckle uh, uh, both uh, the integration step and the reconstruction step, and you see that uh, you get kind of an improvement by a factor of n uh, when you want to buckle, and therefore for n sufficiently small, you get the theorem. So that's, I mean, in a certain sense, this uh, is very clean, and it's very clear how to see how to go to alpha uh, larger than zero. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the first part. So um, now let's go slightly more into the machine room and let me explain to you what our kind of tools when it comes to integration and reconstructions are. So uh, when it comes to integration, uh, I would say, I mean, so the main, our kind of main novelty really lies more on the integration where we use, uh, make good use of modern approach to Schauder theory, which is connected to the name of Safonov. Uh, whereas in the reconstruction, it's uh, kind of a little more, kind of more or less a little thing that the semi-group property of the convolution makes this reconstruction uh, argument very handy. So let me briefly tell you about both, because they have the uh, uh, they have the same f flavor to it. So uh, so the abstract integration lemma takes uh, takes the following in words. It takes the following uh, shape. If you have kind of any type of coefficient field and you have your potential solution u, and you find kind of uh, a jet, so functions which depend on the active variable but also on the base point, so that this expression is small to order kappa minus two kappa being some exponent between zero and two, and if in, in addition you know that this jet depends continuously on the base point to order kappa, then you know that indeed uh, this jet is a good approximation of your original function. And uh, both, uh, both uh, assumptions, so the fact that uh, 
uh, uh, you have uh, kind of this good approximation property of your jet with respect to the variable coefficient PDE, which you're interested in, as well as this continuity condition, take on a certain graded form as we're used from regularity structures. So here, uh, to measure the error here, we take the convolution and we look at the distance to the base point and we get an expression or we impose an ex expression which depends on the solution to the base point and on the uh, uh, convolution length scale. And, uh, and this continuity in the base point uh, has kind of a very sim similar flavor to it. And, uh, and then that's the, uh, that's the outcome. So that's the, uh, that's the only way we ever use the PDE uh, that uh, in, in form of this, uh, of this abstract, uh, abstract integration lemma. And, uh, and again, as I said, um, this, uh, the proof of this lemma is really a kind of just a, a twist on, uh, on Safanov's approach to Schauder theory. So Safanov has, and I, I know it from the books of Krulov, uh, has this kernel-free approach to Schauder theory. So the idea is that you prove Schauder theory not by looking at kernels and cutting integrals into pieces, but uh, by looking at approximations by polynomials. And now this is really the right thing for uh, regularity structures of rough path, because the only thing you have to do is you have to enrich your space of polynomials by your model. And, uh, and that's some, something which in a certain sense fits very nicely into, uh, into this, uh, into this uh, approach by, by Safonov. So that's, uh, that's really, I think, perhaps besides bookkeeping, the, uh, uh, the most important, uh, important ingredient of uh, what we're doing. And, uh, and here, is the, uh, here is kind of the, uh, 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 the reconstruction theorem, so which in a certain sense has a very much the similar flavor, uh, but that's kind of essentially what, uh, what, what the standard reconstruction uh, theorem does. You have kind of, uh, again, you have, if you want, germs of distribution. So at every base point, you have something which kind of should be eventually a distribution or which is a distribution, but now out of kind of this family of distributions, you want to build a single distribution. And, uh, and for this, you need a continuity condition in the base point, which again is kind of uh, probed by convolving the distribution and uh, getting this, uh, making this greater type of assumption. And then indeed, you can uh, kind of reconstruct. There is a single distribution that's described by, by this family. And here, it's convenient to have this, uh, uh, this parabolic uh, convolution semi-group because it very naturally allows for dyadic decomposition. How much time do I still have? So. Okay, so uh, so those are kind of the two uh, uh, the two technical ingredients. Now the place where uh, one has to work more, and where the bookkeeping is uh, 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 requires more, is when you want to leave this uh, what I call semi uh, semi concrete model here, and you really want to target something that's tailor made for your quasi-linear equation. And in this case, you have to kind of look at uh, kind of a slightly larger model. You have to construct it, and then you have to pass from the concrete to the semi-concrete to use the, uh, uh, the theorem from before. So now, uh, now the model, as I said, is slightly larger. It's convenient to take the constant function into your model, the affine, the x1 function. The alpha is defined as before, and, uh, and then there, uh, 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 um, uh, four more model, um, model functions which are defined in kind of in, in the obvious way. So uh, W2 alpha has the right hand side V alpha, V1, V alpha. Um, W3 alpha 1 has the right hand side V alpha. W2 alpha 2 has the right hand side with these rows exchanged. Oops. And then we also need a fourth function uh, because we have the uh, we have the uh, the affine function here. And that's of course a regular product here. So um, 
so now we need uh, we need rough uh, we need controlled rough path conditions on uh, on these basis functions, and that would get a little bit complicated to describe. And there, it's very convenient to use uh, kind of the general setup of regularity structures, and uh, we like to encode them in terms of what we call a skeleton, uh, which is kind of a, a, a tridiagonal matrix, which. Uh, in a certain sense, tells you how the different levels are connected, and to write the uh, kind of write the uh, uh, the modeled uh, sorry the uh, the controlled rough path condition in a single line with help of the skeleton, which involves all these uh, kind of seven basis functions, and uh, so that's uh, uh, that's when it comes to the uh, controlled rough path conditions, but then we also need the commutator conditions. So uh, there we look at kind of the product model, which uh, has kind of that many entries, and we use the product skeleton, which is got just obtained by dyadic products, to kind of impose these uh, the equivalent uh, the equivalent of these uh, commutator conditions. So all this can be very efficiently kind of uh, uh, encoded uh, in, in terms of this uh, in terms of this uh, 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 subdiagonal matrix with entries one on the diagonal. And, uh, and then, uh, then we're using kind of the notion of, uh, from regularity structures, the notion of a model distribution, which we think of as being a space point, a base point dependent form on the space of placeholders. But now since all these placeholders, since all these functions depend on the parameters A0 and kind of double parameters A0 prime, this is really an infinite dimensional space. And, but we don't care, or we, we're not intimidated by this, and impose kind of the same type of uh, uh, continuity, uh, the same type of continuity condition we also, uh, uh, which is also there in, in, in the usual regularity structures, but uh, now kind of presented in a slightly different way, uh, because we think of model distributions as forms, uh, so that this is something which we call form continuity. And then kind of the main goal is to, uh, uh, we're given now kind of a good description of our coefficient field A in terms of uh, a bottle distribution VA, and now we want to kind of reconstruct or we want to get from there the ingredients for the semi-abstract theory so that eventually we can, uh, 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 we, we have this operator from a model distribution uh, describing A to a model distribution describing U. And that can be, uh, that can be done, there are two, uh, two lemmas which provide, this, uh, which provide this translation. So uh, now starting from this side, uh, there is a single function v2 alpha and a single uh, unique uh, function v2 alpha, a unique pair of a function v2 alpha and a, a, a distribution uh, which sits on the left-hand side, which are characterized by controlled rough path condition and uh, a commutator condition and which satisfy what they should satisfy. And the same is true for uh, the next level, so V3 alpha and the product, uh, uh, and here you kind of get tens of products of the, uh, of the input. And in principle, now if you were to go with alpha even one step further, you would get a third dimension into, into, uh, uh, by taking triple products. So it's, but in the end, those are very algebraic uh, uh, manipulations. Okay, so I think uh, uh, that's um, all I wanted to say. Um, so uh, uh, let me summarize. Um, so our approach to these quasi-linear equations is really to look at the uh, variable coefficient linear equations, which I think is what PDE people should do. And um, uh, so, but then, then we have this problem that we have rough coefficients and kind of even rougher right-hand side. And so in the, in the first part I presented uh, kind of the semi-concrete solution theory with a kind of minimalistic model where everything kind of works uh, at perfection and uh, which relies on our kind of abstract integration and reconstruction theorems. And then in the last part, very quickly, I showed uh, how to go from, uh, from a concrete situation which has a concrete uh, nonlinearity here, it's the simplest one in mind, uh, and a concrete model to the semi-concrete uh, situation. So uh, we, haven't, uh, we haven't fully completed the picture, uh, so what still needs to be done is getting the contraction 
property of this mapping on the level of model distributions. We have the self map property, but we don't have the contraction yet. We're confident. Treat a more general nonlinearity, not just this one, which would kind of enrich this model. Uh, show stability in the F. All this is okay in the very first range in the paper, in the first paper with Henrik, we did all this, but now it's, we want to go to the other ranges. And, uh, and of course, and this is something uh, which a PhD student of mine, Claudia Reitel, is doing with Yonasawa, is uh, eventually we want to get rid of these time, this assumption of time periodicity, which I think is very helpful in, in our mind and uh, from our techniques and to, uh, 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 to convert to a true initial value problem. Uh, but uh, uh, like for boundary values, that's not uh, kind of just a three-line thing, but requires some work. Okay, so I think I'm done. <laughs> Thank you very oh. much. Uh, are there any questions? Uh, how does renormalization enters in your theory, and how can you deduce the correct renormalization in this context? So, so I didn't, uh, I didn't um, explicitly uh, um, uh, write this down here, but uh, um, one advantage is that uh, in this, sorry, uh, in this theory, uh, because of, oops, because of this algebraic structure, which is sitting here, we get uh, kind of very algebraic and local expressions for the counter terms, which you need to subtract. So, uh, so uh, I, I mean, in principle, uh, uh, I could, and I should have perhaps on the slides, and we did in the, uh, in the posted, uh, in the posted uh, uh, papers, uh, 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 write down the, the counter terms and how they kind of algebraically and locally depend on A, on the coefficient, right? I mean, so, uh, so the important uh, uh, outcome of this approach is that uh, uh, the counter terms are very clearly ex identified in terms of the A and therefore in terms of uh, the nonlinearity, if you have it. I don't know whether this answers to some extent the question. Well, we can talk about it later. Any other questions? <laughs> 